Yeah, hi. Um, so this is a talk, I'm, it's a bit like one I'm going to do in Germany in about two weeks' time. And so uh, um, you yeah, sort of like the practice. Um, so sorry about that. Um, if I didn't have this, I wouldn't have prepared for it. Um, so I'm talking about making... Let's move that pointer. Um, video, which isn't realistic. Um, it isn't useful and it isn't state of the art. I'm talking about something I did um, seven years ago. So now I used to be an artist. Well, I sort of still am, except I don't do anything. Um, but you don't you don't retire. You just kind of um, fade away. Um, but I used used to make my money by making machines that would make artworks. Now, I didn't make much money, but the way i do it is I'd make a proposal to the Arts Council, the CNZ, whatever they were called, they are called, and the uh, Art Gallery, and they'd give me a bit of money to, to make something. And uh, what I proposed is um, an artwork that had a... I thought I had a picture. Um, it had a computer that was um, listening to people approaching the gallery, and um, it would work out what they're talking about, and it would make video about what they were talking about. And they'd go in there, and they would think that um, the the video was really topical, and they'd think it was <laughs> really right on. And then they'd just walk away and think, you know, that was a really good work, a great artist. <laughs> and they'd, they'd never be told. And. Um, <laughs> And so I, I had an idea of how it would work. Um, oh, here's, here's the picture. So there, yeah, there's the microphone. It's got a TV aerial, which um, I'll get to what that's about. Um, so for speech recognition, it used Pocket Sphinx, which is an open source speech recognition engine. Um, and it would collect video or, and tag it by um, watching TV and reading the teletext subtitles. And then it could associate the um, images with um, the words, kind of like as, you know, that were cl close to them, close to the pictures. And it would kind of build up some idea of what words went with which images and use that. Um, and some, somehow it would have, um, I, don't, I didn't have any idea how the creation would work or what the database would look like. Or, what, or maybe I did, I can't remember. But that was the whole point. You said, I want, that's what I wanted to work on. And the um, speech recognition and the, you know, the whole thing was like a little hook that I knew that the funders would, would go for. And, and they did. So um, anyway, but New Zealand, the English doesn't work with open source speech recognition. It, well, at least it didn't in 2012. And um, to, to make it work, you need to collect up a corpus of uh, hundreds of hours of um, speech, which is all exactly transcribed to exactly the words that they were, say, were said. And um, the video collection. Now, the, as soon as I got the money, they changed the, um, the TV broadcast format. So you couldn't, the analog TV went out, which actually, strangely enough, it had digital text. It had, teletext was text. And then the um, digital TV, um, the subtitles are images. It's like a, like a GIF that kind of goes on top of the video. So I would need to start doing um, OCR on it and having to guess what font it was and stuff. So that got, that got hard. And things went wrong, like I, um, um, my DVB card wasn't supported in the kernel. And so I made a patch that fixed it. but it, introduced a locking bug and I broke the rest of the kernel. Um, and um, the video creation, I still didn't know what it was gonna, how it was going to work. But um, what I ended up doing is spending a whole lot of time researching speech recognition because that was the, it kind of got interesting trying to work out how to do that. And um, some of the papers I was reading about were about um, recurrent neural networks used for um, Language modeling. Now, in 2011, um, like the year before I was doing this, 
there was a um, someone had used an old fashioned Elman network to the model language. Like this is the Elman recurrent neural network. It's the simplest kind of one you can get. And it's from the 80s. And everyone just sort of left the whole field alone. And then this guy, <coughs> um, Thomas Mikhailov, he wrote a PhD thesis about um, how they're actually better for language modeling than anything else, which was a, a surprise to everyone. And, I, so the, and, and to me, because I never really looked at them. And, and then I, anyway, so I got interested in recurrent neural networks. Now, does anyone want me to try and explain this? It'll take ages and all. <laughs> um, the thing is, there, there are so many um, blog posts in the world explaining how neural networks work at the simple level, and that, um, I don't really want to be an embodiment of just embodiment. Explain, just explain what your unfolded diagram means okay. in terms of the other ones. So a normal, yeah, yeah a normal neural network like a multi-layer perception, they used to be called, now they're called deep learning and stuff. So you've got your input layers and you've got some hidden layers. Uh, um, when, when people say multi-layer perception, they mean one hidden layer. If there's more than one, it's not multi, it's just deep. Um, <laughs> and then they've got the output. And basically, the, you just multiply, you have these lines of weight, have weights, and you multiply numbers together, and add them together, and squiggle them around a bit, and then they go up the other end. And with a recurrent neural network, as well as going that way through, you, they come out the top in the weighted time um, step. These, there are little um, hourglasses there representing a, a weight. And then they go back around into the, into the um, hidden layer again. So here, you've got your inputs coming in. Um, and then they go into the outputs from the hidden layer, and they also go to the hidden layer for the next time step. So that, going that way, is the same as these lines going around like that. So Douglas, the weights of the recurrent connections are, are, are treated differently from regular weights in the network? They're not treated differently, they're just, it's just that they, ca they come from, they don't come from new information, they come from the previous state. So it's like the ongoing state of mind of the recurrent neural network. Yeah, they're, they're all different values and they have got a different history. They've got, like these ones up here are based on, the, on what's there and what's there and what's there. And so they're kind of based on the whole of history all through time. They remember everything, um, except they're made of floating point numbers so they f forget everything. <laughs> um, and this, the, the, the modern ones are much more complicated than these simple ones. They, they, have, they have ways to try and not forget everything, but I prefer the old ones, actually. So, um, anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, uh, um, I ran out of time. <laughs> um, and I had nothing. Well, I didn't completely run out of time. I had a few weeks left. And I had an, an interest in recurrent neural networks, and I had to. I thought what I had to do is make a, an artwork that would generate video based on learnt stuff um, that would respond to sound in some way. And I thought that would, you know, please everyone. They wouldn't really care how it worked um, if it was close enough. And um, it was for the Dunedin Public Art Gallery, so I had to make it and get it down there and get down there and so anyway so I thought about using a recurrent neural network to generate the whole video and immediately I realized that was um, not going to work because there's just so many like this isn't this is only like 20 by 20 or something like these pictures like this is a film strip so time is going th that way here time is going that way um, but what it, what it is yeah. The way, you, if you're doing recurrent neural network generation of full video, of a whole video screen, you just put all of the pixels in as your um, input. Well, this is one way. And 
um, it would mix it up with its hidden state and output uh, um, something. And then for training it, you'd, you'd actually show the actual real next picture and the difference between wh what it gave you and what it um, should have given you um, is, is the, how, how much you punish it. And then um, you just keep doing that on and on. Um, if I sit down, you can't see me. And now the, tr the trouble with this, apart from that, there would be so many numbers you have to munch together because there are so many pixels on a, you know, in a reasonably sized screen. Um, the, the creating each one individually, which is essentially what you're doing, um, you end up overfitting them for their particular little role. You, and you need, you, need, you need gazillions of hours of training data. And I only had, I had no training data <laughs> um, and no time. So, oh yeah. And then the way you'd use this kind of network to, to generate video anyway is you'd, you'd let it generate a picture and then you'd show that picture as your frame and then you'd use that picture that you showed as the next um, <coughs> frame and the next timestamp and, and put it through. You just keep doing that. So you, you, it treats its own output as its, its input and kind of drifts off in a dream somewhere. And that's um, basically what you do. Um, so this artwork was called Recur in the end. Um, and instead of doing the full video, I used a uh, four by three grid, which um, isn't many pixels. I mean, most screens have got a better resolution. <laughs> um, but but as, um, now, the computer I was using was from 2007. It was a Core 2 Quad, which was quite good at the time. So anyway, what, what, what it would be the, the, the input would be the, these um, 12 pixels, three values for each because um, there's three colours. Well, there's um, a luma and there's um, two chrominance ones. It's not RGB, but it might as well be. Um, and also the neighbouring ones, the neighbouring pixels, which in this case, on the, on the top level, so this goes, as well as being recurrent, it's recursive, this one. So, it's going to take me a while to explain. So there's um, the top. It, it takes in the. These are out of order. So let's go to. The, no, no. Hang on. I'll, I'll go to. Okay, I'll go back. <laughs> um, it generates an eight by six frame. It learns to generate eight by six pictures from the previous four, three by four, four by three. So it takes this, that's the input, and that's the output. So it, um, it doubles the resolution, and the way, and what it's trained on, and this is what I should have put the slide I put, should have put here, is, is bits of the image. So I made an assumption, which is um, slightly invalid, that um, video is. Um, Invariant and in, across scale and location in the in the um, frame. So if you take a, a chunk here or a chunk there, you can train on that. It's the same as tra training on the whole lot. If you've got your if you if you can find if you can find an eight by six chunk and average it down to four by three, um, then then you keep looking at that bit. And you um, say that these four by three pixels are going to turn into these eight by six. Um, you can it kind of increases the res resolution, um, and then you can in each quarter of that you can do the same thing. So here um, is, in this this section, seeing that those twelve pixels and these ones is the surrounding ones. On, the, on this one, it kind of has to extend magically out, pretend, 
and then it goes rec uh, recurses and rec recurses. And um, so that means that you can have a small recurrent neural network that can generate a whole lot of video. Um, and if it watches enough of TV, which is what it was going to watch, um, then it would kind of start to make video that moved in the sort of way that TV moved without uh, breaching any copyright because, you know, all it's done is watch TV. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but also the other input was going to be um, audio because then, as well as having the, the, the pixels, um, if it got in an audio segment, that, like, like that's kind of came in together, there's the three by four going out to the bigger one. Um, this is the training process, um, which it just watches the video and it learn, reads the audio and it kind of trains on a whole lot of bits in it and it checks out the result. All it's keeping is the weights that it learns for itself. Um, and so then, my hope was that a sound um, that someone made in the room would be uh, would be associated with a kind of video pattern, and that would uh, alter the way that the video um, worked. Um, and then, so in the, I probably need titles on these. Um, this is the same thing, but um, with a microphone and the projector and checking out the audio that it makes because we're not, we're not, um, it's not producing audio, it's just learning from it. Um, so rather than being like that, it was going to be like that. So the microphone's in the room and the TV area was, is collecting the TV. But um, so when it got there, there were two problems. Um, I didn't have a microphone. <laughs> and, and no one could find one. Oh, I don't know, it didn't work. I can't remember why it didn't work. Also, but the TV didn't work. The, the TV reception didn't work. Um, because it was the Dunedin Public Art Gallery, which is a big, huge concrete building. And it was right in the middle, and just no TV. Um, so I watched a video. I watched a Louis Thoreau documentary. Um, <laughs> And the endless loop, um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and um, so yeah, more like that. Oh, yeah. Well, I can do a I can do a demo. <laughs> um, so this is n this is not a Louis Thoreau. This is something I found at archive.org. So. It kind of starts off looking like this kind of thing, like a, like a tartan blanket. But it kind of changes gradually. And um, I, I was quite happy with it. And, and the, in the show, um, it was actually the, it was um, about a quarter of that size because this laptop is faster than, than the thing I had. Um, and it would just keep learning Louis Thoreau videos um, and trying to get closer and closer, which we're not going to see it do at all in, in the next little while. Um, but anyway, I, I came back to Wellington and then when I um, went to collect it again, they said that it had stopped going because the, the disc had died anyway. But it, it, didn't, fr it didn't stop producing a video it just froze it's like I mean it would have been waiting on some log file or something that was trying to or reading the video or something so um, it went for a month or so and then it sort of disappeared or stopped paused um, and so let's get out of that one because I've got I've got more Right, so th then shortly after that, someone else wanted me to do um, another thing. And this time, I thought I'd use a recurrent neural network based cellular automata. Now, um, 
do you know what cellular automata are? Like life, yeah. So, um, which is a kind of a thing where the pixels turn on or off based on the, the immediate neighbours. Um, now, if you um, extrapolate that out a bit, and, and there were simple rules, like there's meant to be two or three or four, whatever it is. Um, Um, a recurrent neural network cellular automata that watches a video and it learns the, um, and it, it watches the, its immediate neighbours around the pixel and it decides what the next pixel is going to be based on its current state and what it sees around it. So it, it makes more complex rules and it then, um, you know, on or off and it's got um, It's got more complex inputs because it's the full colour, um, you know, nine pixels. Or you can easily have it more than nine pixels. You can make it look further out. It just makes the pictures look different. Um, and so I showed this one, and that worked quite well. Um, didn't look, it didn't look at all like the, like the um, input video, which was probably Louis Thoreau again. But it, it um, started kind of being a little bit like Space Invaders, or just kind of a little, th well, all a bit like life, really, little ships flying about, but, but not in the same kind of, in, in that life thing you kind of, they have, um, you know, the names, they have the enumerated, but this is kind of more organic. Um, oh, yeah. Um, so in this case, it's, I don't know what it's going to do, um, <laughs> but it, it just generates video, and if, you, if you're lucky, if you come into the art gallery at the right time, it looks good. <laughs> um, so... I think that's basically my talk. Wait, how am I doing for time? What was it? You've got to fill five more minutes. I've got Okay. So, um, oh, okay, I've got, I've got more to talk about. Um, so, anyway, then I've done this, and I, actually, at that point, I was completely broke. And, I, um, well, after the first one, I, I came back to Wellington, and um, I didn't have... Any, anything, any money or anything to do. I went to Dragonfly um, Data Science and I said, um, well, Ed asked me how I would detect bird calls and I said I would use a recurrent neural network because it was the only thing I could possibly think of. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I kind of got a job there doing that. And then um, from bird calls it went to humans and um, we, we made a system that listens to the radio and sees what language is being spoken um, for to the EV stations, um, if, whether they're speaking Maori or English, and it uses it uses the same thing that this is doing, same um, code. Actually, speaking of code, I do have another thing to say. I do have more slides. Um, I I wrote it in C. Um, using GStreamer, which is a multimedia framework. It's kind of... I don't know if it's good, a good idea or not. Um, I've, I've previously done things using um, just hacking mPlayer, which is kind of simpler in a way. Um, but GStreamer, you know, you can, you can... It's easy to change out. You, you think you're going to be watching TV, but you have to watch your file. There's, you don't change your code, you just let it happen. The same with the player probably. But um, the trouble is with GStreamer, you have everything, every variable starts with G. And um, you have, you have um, glib things and GST things and GTK things. Um, and it's, it's complicated until you get to the point where 
you realise what your boundaries are. You, you've got your little buffer, and you, if you're just dealing inside that, it's all easy again. Um, anyway, and, and my, my recurrent neural network was able to be faster than anyone else's at the time because um, it was tiny and small, and um, I didn't use the, the um, libraries, the matrix libraries, because I, I started to, but then I kind of worked out if I wrote it myself. I, like I could do things like uh, some of the some of the things I'd know was 75% of the time that it was going to be zero. And if you multiply the whole row by zero, the answer is still zero. Um, whereas the um, system libraries kind of don't don't know what you're dealing with. Um, and I, I would, these, are, these are basically my, my, um, my best tricks were to um, make sure all the um, arrays were aligned to 16 byte boundaries which fitted the, the SEC commands that were the, were the fanciest thing of, at the time. Now, now they have, now it's probably 64 you want to align them to. Um, <clears throat> and that the, I made sure every a length of every array was rounded up to a, to a multiple of um, of four floats, which is the same as 16 bytes. And then uh, every all well, the functions that were dealing with it, I just tell them using these macros that they didn't need to worry about the end, the beginnings or the ends of any of the arrays, because not um, you know if you if you're trying to loop over something and see without telling it this, it'll go in little steps to the beginning of, of your fast loop and then do the fast loop and then do little steps at the end and you can just cut that out. Um, and that's basically the, the, how I made it work. Um, oh yeah, and this is what I was getting on to. Oh, and the other thing I used it for um, is identifying anonymous authors. Well, this, um, was this code was the world champion <laughs> at identifying um, at yeah identifying anonymous authors in a, in a competition where um, you're just using the same recurrent neural network rather than feeding it video frames feeding it letters it would predict what the next letter would be and then you get a cross entropy and uh, um, it turned out to be better than all the silly things that other people were doing and that's all the um, all I've got to say. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Who owns the copyright on artistic works created by the output of an algorithmic neural network? <laughs> um, well, m well, m my policy has been nobody. Cool. Um, other people. They just claim it, which is fair enough, too. Um, I ask because I actually just watched a video by um, a YouTube musician named Adam Neely on who owns the copyright of algorithmically created pieces of music. Yeah. And it's actually quite interesting. The, um, the answer is basically nobody, because there's a couple special rules about what music needs to be in order to be copyright a full. Yeah. Um, and human composed happens to be in the law, um, along with a couple other things like distinct and a fixed work, like a recording or a main or a transcript or something. Um, so yeah. there's, there's some interesting rules. And in that video, he was discussing it only in terms of music. But it makes me wonder about things like this. And I have no idea. And but I guess you're doing it all in public domain, sort of open like, for now, so it's Yeah, important. yeah, yeah. Um, I've, I've done other things, actually, that um, I've got one that took photos of clouds and, I, you know, set, they presented them on the website that's gone now. But I kind of um, selected them using a neural network and stuff. And it said on that, you know, you can use it anywhere no attribution, nothing. And um, I've got more questions about whether people can use it than anything else. <laughs> I think because I think it says what's said, 
can use it without attribution. They were they didn't maybe they thought they needed to ask if they could use it with attribution. Anyway. Thank you. <laughs>